Ever since Star Wars Celebration, I have been super hyped for The Mandalorian, and I figured, you know, it has been a couple of months since I last did any crazy prop building projects, but that's all about to change because for this video, I'm going to take you along as I build The Mandalorian's helmet. Now there are already a lot of 3D print files for the Mandalorian's helmet, but a lot of the helmet files were designed before there were the necessary reference pictures for accuracy. Eventually I did find a file that I was super happy with. It does have a couple of things that need adjusting, but overall it's a beautifully made model. The link to the print file that I'm using will of course be in the description box. The next step of course was to actually print the file off. I use a Creality CR-10S printer that has been pretty heavily modded, um, and I decided to use black PLA for this um, model. I use black plastic for most of my helmets. I just like the black. Most of my props and stuff will be pre-sprayed black as like the base coat um, as opposed to white because I like the like dry brushing technique and black is just my preference so printing it in black already saves me from having to worry about spraying the inside you know everything is already black if for some reason things get sanded down back to the plastic or any part doesn't get quite painted it's already the color that i want it to be the entire print job for all of the helmet pieces did take me about 90 hours to complete, but I do have it on pretty conservative settings just because I want the kind of base pieces to be as smooth as possible from the get-go. Now one of the main things that actually sold me on this file were the earpieces. It just seems to be something that there were definitely not the reference photos for for some of the earlier 3D print models that people created, but these ears were really, really close to what the actual helmet has, and they're beautifully detailed and sculpted. And I don't want this to come off as like condescending or snobby, I just really wanted to build the most screen accurate helmet that I possibly could for this video. Here are all of the pieces printed out. Now most of them still have all of the support material and like um, wraps and bases and stuff that I had to print them with, um, but some of them I've actually gone ahead and kind of just tested and checked out what they look like without the supports on. Um, but yeah, these are all of the pieces. You have like the two ear pieces over here. Um, like the back piece and then it's it's basically divided into eight pieces so there's pretty much like two of each so like for instance this is one of the front side pieces as you can see like the visor hole um, is there it's super awesome looking so far but obviously now I have to go ahead and continue to remove the rest of the support material to actually get it down to the actual piece for removing support material, I just use these more fine nose pliers. I find that they work great like grasping on to the different supports um, and also help to kind of remove any of the pieces left over. I do eventually also normally use a hot knife to kind of burn any extra pieces down to make it as smooth as possible. Now a couple of these pieces I did actually print less ergonomically than I would. They definitely took more time and did kind of waste more plastic with support material, but I wanted them to print right side up so that the texture on the outside, they were the front top pieces. I just wanted to make sure that they were nice and smooth from the get-go as opposed to the back pieces. They did have these supports on the outside of the dome and required a lot more work to smooth out than the front dome pieces did. So fast forward to like an hour later, I sanded down all of these pieces because now I'm going to go ahead and actually start assembling them. So I just sand like all of the edges that are going to get glued down with what kind of sandpaper did I use this time? 100 grit. Um, sandpaper just to roughen up the edges so that the super glue um, likes to adhere the pieces together. I just, you know, normally if the uh, texture of the surface is not that smooth or just a little bit rougher at least, um, the super glue likes adhering better. So this is the glue that I like using for assembling 3D um, printed pieces. Yeah, I'm going to start assembling this. 
Because I have to measure and cut down the visor to fit into the helmet, I'm basically assembling it front half and back half. So right now I'm only worried about assembling the front four pieces. This is really just for ease. Obviously it is a lot easier to measure for a visor when you don't have the back of the helmet attached. So here are the first four pieces all super glued together. The super glue has now basically dried completely. And what I actually do to um, any sort of 3D printed pieces that have seams that I'm really concerned about, you know, the integrity of the structure and, you know, just stabilizing it and keeping those pieces together is I actually JB weld. Um, of course, these ones are super like mangly and old because it's well loved stuff around here. Um, here's the new set that I have specifically bought in case I need it for this helmet. Um, it is cold welding, um, like epoxy, a two-part um, thing that of course um, the chemical reaction um, then hardens it completely. I actually kind of slather this stuff um, all on the inside of the helmet at the seams. I know lots of people like using Bondo um, for kind of reinforcing and smoothing and stuff, which I have definitely used, um, for the seams as well. It kind of depends on what I'm building. Um, all of the seams on this basically are hidden, so I'm not super worried about the kind of smoothness of the seams. Obviously, there, there, I think there is a couple that you will see, um, so whether I actually use Bondo or not, that is yet to be seen, but JB Weld on the inside is always a must for me. But the whole reason, as I mentioned kind of before, that I wanted to build basically essentially the front part of the helmet is because of the visor. Because the other thing that I do with the JB Weld is I actually install T-nuts into the inside to then install the visor. So the ones that I am using, actually these ones are new ones, they are smaller than the ones I have used previously. This is what a T-nut is. Um, I get the ones that are like flat. I know a lot of people use like the raised um, ones that you then kind of like um, push down like the raised like clip pieces. I don't know what you'd call it, um, but I use like using the flat ones. It's cleaner and I feel like because there are the holes in um, the T-nut itself, it actually helps um, adhering it to whatever you're adhering it to so the JB Weld, you know, can sink in to those holds and kind of, you know, you're reinforcing it from like JB Weld on like the back side and on the top and it just gives it a nice secure hold. So these ones are a bit smaller than your typical ones and I also have the uh, bolts that then screw into them. So basically you install these, um, you measure where they are in here. So for this one, Another thing I'm going to talk about, normally you do like middle, the very edge here and at the bottom. The problem with this particular Mandalorian helmet is the very bottom right here is extremely small and it's not going to fit um, one of those T-nuts. Other than like this whole visor is going to have to be super specifically trimmed, which is another reason I wanted like the uh, the most that I possibly could of the helmet open, like just have the front and not have to like fight inside a helmet basically if the back was already on um, because the um, like the jaw pieces, the really indented pieces here mean that this is going to have to be really specifically cut to fit in there nicely. Normally the kind of indentation is back further and it's not so much of a big deal. So this is going to be a very specific job but the T-nuts on the inside here are not going to fit, so what I'm actually going to try and do is use some Chicago screws. I have like a million and a half Chicago screws because I use them all the time. Some people might call them binding posts, and the actual like head of the thing is a lot smaller, so I can't actually even install this at the very bottom. It's going to have to be up a bit, but I figure having something down a little bit here is going to be a lot better than having nothing there. So... We're going to be doing a T-nut installation here on the sides, right here, and then Chicago screws on either side closer to the bottom there. So that's kind of going to all happen at the same time when I have the JB Weld mixed up. 
JB Weld is obviously pretty strong stuff, so you do want to take some safety precautions when using it. I like to mix it up on some tin foil. I just kind of roll up the edges just to make sure it doesn't like start running off of the side, and I also like using popsicle sticks to apply it. But yeah, like I said, I basically just slather a bunch on on all the seams and, you know, obviously the plastic doesn't fit a million percent perfectly together. I do like to sand it down so that it fits as good as possible, but there are obviously some small kind of gaps in between and so this really soaks into those small gaps and also just reinforces the entire back of the seam so it is less likely to kind of break and crack. Here is what the inside of the helmet looks like now that all of the JB Weld has set. Obviously you can see where the T-nuts are installed with the JB Weld and so now we can actually start creating the template for the visor. I like starting off with tracing paper. Because it is a lighter paper, it means you can poke the T-nuts through a lot easier to give you kind of an exact area of where your holes are possibly going to be. Obviously, because it is a bit of a flimsier paper, those can change, but it gives you a good place to start. Once I have a tracing paper template, I then like to create a kind of more final one using cardstock. Just something that is a heavier paper that likes to keep its shape more, um, and that's actually going to mimic kind of the rigidness of an actual visor. So of course I'm also test fitting the cardstock template and making any adjustments that might be needed to it to make it fit even more accurately. The main thing for this template was I was constantly having to cut back even more from the sides so that it actually fit in um, beside the indented areas. Once I was happy with the fit of the template, of course, it's now time to actually cut the visor itself. The standard for most Star Wars helmet visors and kind of lens areas is to use a welding visor in the darkest shade available. Obviously, to actually cut the visor, I'm using scissors, but as far as the holes go, I like to burn them kind of through with a hot knife point, um, just because the holes are generally subject to minute kind of adjustments, you know. The welding visor obviously is a lot stiffer than any kind of cardstock paper you can create, so most of the time you kind of have to wiggle and kind of burn a hole from side to side just so that it fits even more snugly. And with the visor test fit complete, I'm now starting to assemble the back of the helmet. I did actually decide to keep the visor installed when I was building the back of the helmet just so that the kind of entire front of the helmet kept its solid shape, um, but it did get removed before kind of continuing on to anything else, especially with painting. That's kind of one of the benefits of having the visor be removable. And of course, now that the entire back portion of the helmet is assembled, I am of course going back with my JB Weld and strengthening those seams. And of course, because it is an entire helmet at this point, you absolutely cannot see what I'm doing on the inside of it. But same idea, just slathering the stuff along the seams. While the JB Weld was setting on the entire helmet, I decided to mark up the adjustments that I wanted to make on the earpieces. Like I said at the beginning, this helmet had by far the most accurate earpieces that I could find on a 3D printed Mandalorian helmet model, but there were a couple of things that needed to be switched up. So using my hot knife, I cut the corners off of this kind of lower area. Um, the sides were angled, whereas on the 3D print, they were kind of straight at the top. There were also holes kind of underneath the main piece, as well as the kind of hole on the front um, part of the piece actually was replicated on the back. So it was like a complete um, mirror piece. So I had to add a hole to the back, which not a big deal, and I also kind of cut along the top area because on the actual um, helmet there is definitely a lot more separation kind of between the two pieces. So yeah, some adjustments needed, but they were pretty easy to execute to get it to be more screen accurate. And here is what the adjusted earpieces look like. 
So one of the main things that I knew I was going to have to adjust on this particular 3D model was the top band. Now, I originally didn't even print the kind of provided uh, band that went along the top of the helmet because I didn't like the angles on it, but ultimately I did decide to print it because I figured it was going to be um, a pretty good base to kind of start with and modify it from there. So as you can see, I kind of marked how wide I wanted the finished band to be on the helmet, um, but it was based on the back area because the back um, kind of panel area, I also know needed modification because on this model, it was more rounded at the top and it had to be straight. So I knew that was getting modified. And so the kind of dimensions of the band were kind of based on that. So there I went along, you know, measuring out how far out it needed to be and then I got to the front and realized in order for the band to be that wide I was also going to have to cut back the sides of the actual kind of front area which is what those lines are kind of down the middle and so at this point I was kind of freaking out because obviously the t-nuts are already installed in this and I'm having to cut more away from the inside and luckily it did not interfere with the t-nuts but for a while there I was really concerned that I was gonna have kind of a big mess on my hands um, for trying to get this as screen accurate as possible. So of course with my trusty hot knife again making those adjustments first I decided to cut back the panel to kind of get it to be the right shape so that I could actually glue in the back panel and then kind of fill in that gap so that um, the panel itself actually looked squared off. To kind of create that shape, I actually used the plastic that I cut off from the front of the helmet. Um, normally, I would possibly use war blood just because it's easier to work with with a hot knife and kind of sculpt out and burn in. Um, and because it is like another heat activated material, uh, it does like to kind of burn and mix with the plastic nicely. So now I'm actually gluing on that upper band, which is in two pieces just for printing ease. Um, I actually already modified the front band. It had kind of this trapezoid shape on the front. So I already burned that down to make it flat in the front. So once the glue had dried, the first modification that I made to the band was I actually flattened out the sides. Uh, it was a bit too raised for my liking, especially because I needed that kind of smooth transition from the further out point that I was creating. So I just basically burnt down the sides so that it blended in with the actual helmet better. The next thing that I did once the edges were burnt down was I actually measured and marked where I wanted the central kind of raised band to go so that I knew where I was going to have to apply the wood filler. Wood filler is honestly one of my favorite materials to use for prop making. It is super easy to use and you can do so much with it. In this case, I am basically filling in that gap and creating a smooth transition between those two lines. I'm really just going to be using this as kind of a rough shape for the more final uh, strip down the center of the helmet. I also decided that I was going to just use wood filler as opposed to bondo to help smooth out any of the more rough patches and seams on the outside of the helmet. Most of the time I actually prefer wood filler to bondo. It can be used indoors, which is always great, especially when you live somewhere with extreme cold weather half of the year. And it's really easy to sand to create a really smooth and perfect finish. So here's the state of the helmet at the moment after giving it a pretty good sand to get all of that um, upper band area nice and smooth so that I can actually move on to the next step which is going to be adding the final band, which I'm actually going to do out of this thin craft foam. As you can see, I've already cut and measured an appropriately sized strip out that I'm going to apply with some hot glue down the center band area. 
I decided to go with the foam strip down the center because it really didn't have to be anything too structurally sound. Obviously, this is basically kind of just a decorative strip at this point. Um, all of the shape and kind of strength and structure comes from the plastic and wood filler underneath it. And because it's foam, it meant that I could easily burn that kind of central band down the center. Now that the band is all complete, I'm finally going ahead and gluing on the ear pieces. Now my personal favorite little trick for smoothing and strengthening foam is to use wood glue. I did end up doing a couple of layers to fully smooth and strengthen the foam strip. Now the helmet base is definitely far from done, but I did want to do a couple of coats of spray primer so that I could actually see what areas needed smoothing more. It's a lot easier to see the texture and uneven areas when your base is all one flat color. The main area that I noticed needed a lot of work was the back panel section. It was just kind of how it printed. Um, because it printed flat, it did have a lot of ridges from the layers of plastic, so it got quite a few coats of wood glue over time. And then I went back with my wood filler and literally pretty much coated the entire helmet in it. The seams and more rough areas obviously got a lot more, but basically the entire helmet ended up in at least a thin coat of it. I did try and use that scraper, but it's just so much easier to apply and put on and smooth out with your fingers, so, you know, it is a bit messy, but it just is a way easier technique to use. And to smooth it out, I just use some water because the wood filler can sometimes feel a bit dry and not like sticking. Once the wood filler had all dried, I completely sanded the entire helmet down. It took me like an hour and a half to completely do. And then I went back in with some more wood glue um, and filled in more of the sensitive areas. So of course this back panel, um, any areas that I kind of noticed when sanding that needed just a bit more work on them, I added some wood glue to. And once the wood glue had completely dried, I went back in with even more spray primer to get it as smooth as possible. I don't actually know how many layers I added. I know that I wish I could have added more, but time constraints and all of that, I only had kind of so many hours to be able to spray it before I actually had to go ahead and start to try and actually get it to the color it needed to be. Speaking of the color it needed to be, this first paint that I used, I had actually never used before, and it was supposed to basically be the final color, but it had like no color, and it was extremely strange, so I had to go back into my stock. I was kind of freaking out, um, but I did find a paint that I had previously used for various costumes um, and used that instead, but I did end up going back over it with the color um, that I'd first use um, as another kind of layer because it did have an interesting kind of actually like aluminum texture. It just had no color. So once the helmet was actually silver, it did give an okay effect, but definitely it was not the original plan. But what was somewhat part of the original plan was using this gold finger rub-on paste. Now, this is something that I had seen an actual prop maker that has worked on Star Wars um, costumes and props um, talking about and like recommending that they really enjoyed using it. And so I bought some just to kind of have in my studio as like kind of backup or just in case I ever needed it. And it's awesome. It's like this rub-on metallic um, paint. It's super thick, um, but <laughs> kind of accidentally and what I realized is that it was a little too silver, so I went to remove the entire thing, which I unfortunately didn't film, but I went to remove the entire thing with some terpenoid, uh, and it gave it literally the perfect color. So here I'm kind of perfecting that Be kind of, I left it to dry a bit to see if it would actually stay and it did. I did later find the instructions that were in the box of this paint that said, oh, you can in fact thin it out with turpentine or turpenoid. Um, but yeah, it gave it the perfect color and finish. It smoothed out the paint so nicely. Um, and yeah, it was just kind of, absolutely perfect, like a great mistake um, somewhat to kind of make. 
So once I was happy with the actual base color, it is now time for weathering. I can never stress enough how important weathering is. It really is what takes uh, a prop and makes it look like it is, you know, from whatever it is from. Like th props and costume pieces that are too clean are the ones that normally look not accurate. Uh, so for this weathering, it was pretty simple. I basically just used two colors. I um, also ended up going in with this brushed nickel paint to darken up some areas. Some areas I knew I was going to have to do this to because they were going to be too silver. Um, there are some areas on the earpieces, which you will see me paint in a bit, that needed the darker paint color that just obviously inevitably got painted because I didn't mask them out, um, which wasn't a big deal. It was an easy fix um, to make. But as far as the weathering itself, I decided to use this, uh, it's a matte metallic paint that I had in my collection that it was the perfect color. Um, and I also went in with like a darker um, espresso brown just to give the weathering some more dimension and to make it look a bit more realistic. Once I was happy with the paint job, my final painting step is to actually spray it thoroughly with this UV archival spray. I had to let that sit for a couple of hours before moving on to the actual final step, which is putting in the visor and final test fitting. So of course, started off with finally removing the protective films from the visor before actually installing the visor into the helmet so that I could mark where the actual end of the visor needed to be before going ahead and actually cutting it. And here is the finished Mandalorian helmet. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you in my next video.